Amen. All I am and all that I have, it's in you, Lord. Father, we so, we're just so thankful that we are, can be found, our peace can be found, our identity can be found, our rest can be found, even in the midst of these difficult times that can be found in you. You are our habitation. You are our rear guard. You are the one who walks beside us and goes with us through every difficulty, trial, and circumstance. Thank you that everything that we need of, everything, is there because of you. And we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you to the worship team. Um, you know, it's, it's unusual and it's difficult sometimes to speak just to a camera, but it's, I got to give kudos to them. It's got to be weird worshiping to a camera too. But, you know, the reality is we're here doing this for an audience of one, really, first and foremost. So uh, I just appreciate you guys bringing your whole heart and leaving nothing, uh, as they say, nothing on the field every week and coming out. Really appreciate it. It is uh, can you, you know, give a little love to them right now? You know, you got the little heart icons and all the rest of it on Facebook. Give a little love to our worship team right now. Can you do that? Amen. Uh, we're so grateful for all the work they've invested, and uh, it has made an enormous difference uh, for us when we stand up here to talk to know that we have them behind us. So bless you guys. Thank you so much. You know, this week, um, I got kind of arrested by the Lord. I had uh, a revelation that I want to bring to you today. Uh, just a word that God put into my spirit, and I've entitled it, In the Midst of a Pandemic, Don't Be a Jonah. In the Midst of a Pandemic, Don't Be a Jonah. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale, as it is often called, uh, but I believe there's a significant message for us this morning to be found in the narrative and the story of Jonah as he experienced, uh, you know, God calling him to go and proclaim a message to the people of Nineveh. You know, Jonah's a simple story of the mercy of God and the unwillingness of Jonah to carry out the mission that God had given to him. And uh, he refused to carry it out, strangely enough, because we find out that he had an understanding of the nature of God. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. If you've never read the story before, it is one of the fastest moving stories in the Bible. It's only uh, five chapters long, and if you get a hold of it and uh, you begin to read in chapter one, so much happens in the first few verses that if you blink, you'd miss it. But there's, there's really no character development before the story. We don't know anything about Jonah before the story hits. We don't know anything about where he lives, what he does for a living or anything else. All we know is that he doesn't seem to be surprised that he's hearing from God some of us, if God spoke to us, we'd be like, you know, who's that? What's that voice? But, but Jonah doesn't seem to be too surprised that he's had a voice speak to him and that it was God. And uh, we also know that he knows some things about the, the nature of God. And so when God in the opening verses says to Jonah, listen, I've got an assignment for you. I want to go, you to go to the town of Nineveh, to the great city of Nineveh, and I want you to proclaim to them uh, my judgment for the, the, the depth of the depravity, the depth of sin that they've been walking in, uh, what we know is that Jonah, inexplicably, instead of doing what God asks, he uh, packs up a few things and goes to Joppa and catches a merchant ship to Tarshish. And he walks away and disobeys the Lord. And like I said, this all happens in the first three verses. And at this point, we're not told why it is that Jonah uh, decides to refuse to obey the Lord. We're just told that he gets on the ship and he heads off to sea. We do know that God is not pleased with Jonah's decision because here he is on the ship and a great storm comes up. God sends, the Bible says, a great wind and a violent storm to the, on the sea, so great that it threatens to break up the ship that they're in. And the sailors, they know this is a really bad storm. These are experienced men. These are men who make their living traveling the seas. And uh, they're so worried, they're so nervous that they begin to throw the cargo overboard in order to lighten the vessel in the midst of the storm. They start pitching the cargo overboard. 
And then they begin to, to, to call it to their gods, to the, whatever religious belief they have, they begin to call out because they're in absolute terror and panic over the situation. Where's Jonah? The Bible says he's in the deepest part of the sheep, of the sh- uh, ship, I should say, and he's having a sleep. That's right. Jonah is so at peace with his decision to run away from God, he's in the bottom of the ship and he's having a snooze. And the captain finds him there, and uh, we read, uh, you know, in the first chapter, I think it's verse 6, he says, uh, the captain finds him and says, how can you sleep, get up, and call on your God? Maybe he will take notice of us, and, will, and we will not perish. Wow. So the captain goes to Jonah and says, dude, what are you doing? How can you sleep at a time like this? And he says, get up and, and call upon your God. Maybe he'll have mercy on us. Well... Jonah gets up, and he prays, but he obviously doesn't pray with much authentic conviction because he does nothing to resolve the situation, and the storm continues to rage. And so much so that the sailors, they, they, without knowing what else to do, they begin to cast lots to figure out who's at fault here. Who are, are the gods angry at for what is, has happened, and why is the storm raging? And of course, they cast lots, and the lot falls on Jonah. And so they look at Jonah, and, and they begin to, to, to grill him. You know, who are you? Uh, where do you come from? What, what nationality are you? What are you doing? And, and Jonah, first thing to credit to him in this story is that Jonah actually first time tells the truth. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a believer in the God who who made the earth and the sea and the wind. And, uh, and then he adds that I'm running away from God. They're like, what? You're running away from God? Are you crazy, man? And, and they, they say, do you, well, what do we need to do to appease him? And, and Jonah says, well, guys, to be truthful, if you really want to get out of this mess, throw me overboard. Throw me overboard. Well, they don't know what to do. They're, they're, the idea of throwing this guy overboard, whose God is causing this storm, does not set well with them. So they row harder. They row faster. They think, maybe we can make it to shore and beat this thing. And so they do everything they can to get ahead of the storm, but the storm only gets worse. And so they finally re- uh, desperately decide, we're going to have to do what he said. We're going to have to throw the guy overboard. Can you imagine? They pick Jonah up, and they toss him into the sea. And as soon as he lands in the sea, God calms the storm, and then he sends a whale or a big fish, the Bible tells us, and it swallows Jonah and spares him from perishing in the sea. Now, all the events so far that I've just described to you take place in only 17 verses of the first chapter uh, of the book of Jonah. Now, the second chapter of the book is Jonah in the belly of the beast, in the, the, the belly of this whale or fish, and he begins to, to, to pray to God. He thanks God for delivering him from the storm. Uh, he begins to <clears throat> speak to God about the whole thing, and all of chapter 2 is basically Jonah praying to God. And you think to yourself, is he, he must have had some kind of a change of heart. Maybe some things are shifting in him. And so he prays and he thanks God. And then the next thing you know, the last verse in chapter 2 just simply says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited bleh, Jonah up on a dry land. Jonah was living such a deplorable life that even, even the fish couldn't stomach him anymore. And he threw him up on shore, and Jonah obviously was thrown up on shore very close to Nineveh because as soon as he uh, is uh, vomited up on shore, the story picks back up with God speaking to Jonah again and telling him to go and proclaim his message to the great city of Nineveh. So the story goes that Jonah actually does what he's told this time. He, he goes to the city and he begins to speak, you know, that... Uh, uh, 40 days from now, you know, Nineveh is going to be overturned. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And uh, it's a big city. It says that, uh, you know, it took three days for him to tour the whole thing. But immediately, immediately the response of the people is that they repent. 
immediately we see in the story that, that the Bible says all of them, from the greatest to the least, they, they begin to put on sackcloth, which was a, a garment, kind of looks a bit like a grain sack, only made out of animal hair, so it would have been really uncomfortable. And they begin to put on sackcloth, and they begin to call out to God, and they begin to repent for their lifestyle and for the sins of their city. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 3 reports that when the news reached the king, when the news reached the king that he rose from his throne and he too humbled himself and he put on sackcloth and he sat down as a symbol of his humility before God in the dust and began to cry out to God. And then the Bible says that the king made a decree. And here's what it says. It says, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but... Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let him, them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Now, this is where the point of what the Lord was speaking to me about in this past week comes into the story. After the king made the decree... Uh, Verse 10 tells us that when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Hooray! Good news, right? I mean, this is good news for everybody. This is good news for uh, the people of Nineveh. This is good news for God, who the Bible says delights in doing goodness and loves to be kind and loves to be compassionate and uh, is slow to anger. And so you'd think this is good news for everybody. Everybody would be happy. And everybody is happy except one person, Jonah. Jonah is not happy. What is Jonah's response to the mercy of God? What is Jonah's response to the mercy of God? Well, chapter 4 begins with Jonah's response. He's not happy. In fact, the Bible says he's greatly displeased. And the more he thinks about it, the more angry he becomes. Imagine that. Jonah is angry about the mercy of God. He is angry that lives are being spared. He is angry about forgiveness. He's angry about the goodness of God. Why? Why is Jonah angry? Well, listen to the words that he prays. Listen to the words he prays to God. He says, oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Unbelievable. And that, I mean, it's unbelievable, right? He's upset that God has been true to his nature and has had mercy on the Ninevites. This is a remarkable uh, individual, I have to tell you. What all normal saints of God would be doing at this point is celebrating, having a party because the goodness of God has been shown to uh, people once again. That the nature, the true nature of our God has ex been experienced by a people who maybe didn't deserve it, but because they turned to him and called to him, God had mercy upon them. And while that's the way all normal saints of God would respond, that's not how Jonah responds. Jonah makes the subject into a complaint to God. And he says, he complains to God as if showing mercy were an imperfection in God's nature. <laughs> he complains to God as if this is somehow a problem that God has had mercy on the people. You know, Jonah turns it into a complaint and he says, is this not what I said to you? Before I left home, God? Is this not why I ran away and didn't want to fulfill the assignment? It's basically what he's saying is, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, uh, one who uh, relents in, in, in not sending calamity. And, and so he said, I knew your nature was merciful, so I knew I would be wasting my precious time if I adjusted my plans and went and did what you asked. I knew it would be a complete waste of time because you would actually come through and forgive these people, and I would have done this all for nothing. Isn't that something? That is the nature of this man, Jonah. He was more concerned. His time, his, 
His schedule, his routine, his lifestyle was more important than the well-being of the people of Nineveh. In fact, he's, he's so upset about this, whether he's just being uh, speaking hyper, uh, with hyperbole or not, I don't know, but he, he, he actually wishes that he was rather dead than have to gone through the effort of bringing a message to the people, the people repent, and then God not follow through. Uh, Jonah suffers from a proud, unloving spirit, and it appears that he neither expected nor desired forgiveness uh, uh, for the people of Nineveh, and he almost seems disappointed that he didn't get to witness their destruction. In this frame of mind, he overlooked the good of which he had been an instrument and the glory and the mercy of God being administered. It's a remarkable story. And probably you're hearing that this morning and you're going, well, you know, what an idiot that guy was. I am so glad that I would never be like that guy Jonah. And you might be hearing this story for the first time this morning, or maybe, you know, you've heard it from Sunday school right up through and heard it a hundred times before. And you may be somebody who views it as mythology, or you may be somebody who says, I believe that that's a literal story. But, you know, either way, you're probably asking yourself, that's a great story. You did a good job telling that story this morning, Pastor. But what does that have to do with us in this current situation that we find ourselves in in this season right now? How did God speak to you? What did he say to you, or do you... Uh, believe or discern that God is saying to us in the midst of this story today. Well, Jonah is an interesting character, that's for sure. Like I said, we don't know very little about him, except that we know that he seemed to be used to hearing from God, and we know that he had a revelation of the nature of God. He knew that God was a God of mercy, a God who was compassionate and gracious and who loved to relent and to show mercy. We also know that despite those pluses, Jonah was a pretty self-centered individual. We know that he was smug in his self-centeredness as well, because not only did he run from God, he was so comfortable running from God that he was sleeping in the hold of the ship in the middle of a storm, and then later he seems to scold God for being merciful. He seems to scold the Creator for being merciful. You know, and you think to yourself, okay... Well, let me ask you this question. Does that sound like anybody that we know? Does that sound suspiciously uh, like ourselves sometimes? Could it be that there's maybe a little bit of Jonah in every one of us this morning? And that we need to guard our hearts against the growth of the spirit of Jonah in our own spirit, that we make no room, no quarter for that spirit, that uh, uh, thought process to develop in our own hearts. You're saying, well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, uh, we're facing a virus that has literally altered the course of the planet and is going to leave an indelible mark uh, in the history books for 2020, that's for sure. And as a result, we have been under an unusual set of circumstances in social distancing and, and uh, self-imposed quarantine, if you will, as we are trying to ride this situation out. And I think in the beginning, we, we all took it pretty much in stride. I mean, even myself, at first I was saying, hey, you know, this isn't a, a Canadian problem, this is an over-there problem, right? This is an over-there problem, and that was true. And uh, that, you know, the odds of you becoming infected were pretty small because it was, after all, an over there problem. But then over there became a European problem, and then it became a Canadian and a North American problem, and uh, it did spread. And then the, uh, the message came out that millions could be infected, if not hundreds of millions, and comparisons between uh, you know, this pandemic and the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 became, uh, began to come out. And uh, we all know that that, that pandemic was ruthless. Uh, 500 million people infected globally uh, and, and over 55 million people died. And so the, the comparison started to come out and people began to become quite fearful. And governments began to take measures to try and 
restrict the spread of the disease and the virus and to stop it from uh, getting a stronghold in our country and around the world. And uh, we understood that uh, the virus was probably not very dangerous to most people, but that it was, in fact, uh, dangerous to a, a, a small segment of the population, primarily the elderly or those who have some kind of other uh, heart or respiratory type condition. And, uh, and in Europe, we read where you know, some villages, their, their elderly population was being decimated by this virus in places like Italy and Spain. Well, then it began to move across the ocean and our own social structures became interrupted. And although the virus uh, you know, was spreading, we were, we were beginning to see that it could have an impact in our own uh, population. And seniors residents in particular were, were vulnerable. So we bunkered down. We did the right thing. We, we preached the message to the people, change your ways, put others first. We joined the world in asking God to protect his people. Now they're telling us that we've done a pretty good job, that uh, as a result of the efforts that we've taken, the reality is, is that the early predictions, the early models of how this thing could spread to hundreds of millions of people uh, don't look like those are going to come to fruition. And we uh, you know, and that we have been able to slow this thing down. We've been able to, uh, the, the message has worked, that lives have been saved. So we should be rejoicing, right? And yet, rather than rejoicing, it's easy to let anger rise up instead. It's easy to become a Jonah. You hear what I'm saying this morning? And even as news comes out that lives are being saved and that physical distancing has likely spread the virus, uh, all reports, which should be causing a celebration, Another voice is gaining traction. It's the voice that says, I knew that there was really nothing to this, that we've given up our lives and our liberties to save a few people, uh, and that the lives that have died, well, they would have died anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've probably all heard them. And it's an angry voice, and it's a voice, I got to admit, that you know, has crossed my own mind as well. I thought, well, man, we have done an awful lot here uh, for the sake of of such a small number, you know, of people. But the reality is, the reality is uh, that every sacrifice we make has impacted somebody's life. And probably now you're sitting in a situation where you know somebody who's been impacted by this virus, somebody who's lost a family member or uh, seen somebody who has, uh, whose life has been completely upended by this. And you know, it's somewhat may be understandable that people outside the kingdom of God might feel this way because the reality is uh, everything they have, all of their investment is in what they have around them and what they can try to control. But our hope is in the Lord. Our trust is in God. And so we rest in him and there is no sacrifice that we make that is too small or too great if it is going to produce uh, a change in people's lives, if it's going to save some, whether through some physical or spiritual loss. We want to see people experience redemption from God. Do I struggle uh, not to be angry at the mercy of God, at a calamity averted? Well, that was, that was certainly the sin and the attitude of Jonah. Do I struggle not to be angry at this season, which truthfully is for the glory of God and has caused more people to turn to God and tremendous advancement in the kingdom than anything probably in the last 50 years? Well, if you do struggle, then that's what Jonah's crime was. Do I struggle not to be angry that my life, my comforts, my routine have been devastated, that I knew this would not turn out to be as predicted and yet lose sight of those that have come to Christ, those that have experienced salvation, those who've experienced uh, peace and compassion from Christ? Well, that's exactly what Jonah did. So let me conclude this morning. Listen, I get it. I'm, I'm preaching to myself here this morning as well. I understand uh, your frustrations. I understand how you feel. It's easy to get frustrated with this present situation. You know, going to the grocery store and you got to queue up. You, know, you can't, can't go to the hardware store to get stuff. You got to phone it in. And how do you describe that you need a thingamajig for a whatchamacallit so that you can put the doohickey together uh, on your toilet? Do you know what I'm saying? And uh, what part do I need? That's, that's a difficult thing for a, a, a layman uh, to be able to, to describe to the person so you can go curbside and pick it up. I, I get all those frustrations are there. 
And, uh, and, and I, I understand that. I, I share those frustrations with you. And, uh, but do we really have any right to be angry? You know, Jonah leaves the city at the end of the story, and uh, he finds a place to rest in the shade, because after all, being angry is hard work. So you gotta, you got to get some rest. And so Jonah, he sits down, and as he's sitting in, the, in this self-made shade, God causes this vine to grow up, and this vine ends up enveloping his little lean-to that he's made and provides a beautiful shade where he's experiencing the comfort that is there, and, and, and it causes him to fall into a rest and a sleep, and overnight uh, he wakes up the next morning, and then the Bible says that God sends a worm, and the worm eats the vine, and that the vine then dies, and it withers, and Jonah's sitting out there uh, now, and he's melting in the sun. And there's a, then the Bible says God sent a scorching wind, and he is just he is just miserable, miserable in his anger. He's he's not only mad now; he's suffering. He is just experiencing so much frustration. And uh, and, and and so God starts the conversation with Jonah again, and he says to him, uh, Jonah. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? And Jonah says, I, I do. I'm angry enough to die. That's pretty angry. I don't know that I've ever been that angry. But Jonah says, yeah, I sure do. I'm angry enough to die. Then God makes, uh, goes in and he makes his point. He makes my point this morning. He makes our point this morning. And he says this. He said, you've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and then died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And that is where the story ends. That is God's final question in the midst of this incredible story. He ends with this profound question, should I not be uh, more concerned? Should I not be concerned about the people than I am about the comforts of your life? You know, before COVID-19, I mean, let's face it, we were pretty much a spoiled people here in Canada. Maybe you haven't had much uh, opportunity to travel, but I can tell you as somebody who's been to about 20-some countries, 23, I think, uh, in the world and had the privilege of working with some wonderful people in many countries, I can tell you that uh, Canada is about the best place in the world to live. And, uh, uh, you know, we have an amazing, amazing country. We have uh, an amazing uh, social structure. We have a great economy. We have so many blessings. But the truth of the matter is that you and I, individually, we did little to create the blessing that we experience every day. The reality is we were born into it, that others before us laid their lives down to produce what's here today, but you and I, we were basically born into it. And sure, we've worked hard. We've taken advantage, many of us, uh, of the, the blessings and the opportunities that have been afforded to us for living in this great country. But let's be honest today, we really haven't had to do much except sit back and enjoy the ride and relish what we experience here in Canada. But our world... Our Nineveh contains millions of souls who don't know the name of the Lord. And uh, we should be concerned about that great number. What is the price, after all, of a human life? What is the price of a soul? Do I remember the Bible says that all heaven rejoices when even one person comes to an awareness of God and, and uh, comes into the kingdom? Do I rejoice when calamity is being averted? You know, if we hadn't have practiced when we did physical distancing, the models had projected, you know, possibly millions of people infected in Canada. And you know what? I don't know if that would have happened or not. It doesn't matter. I'm able to say, you know what? If doing what we've done has saved even a few lives, I can live with that. Can you? I think we need to be people who, who can live with it. We need to be a people who who actually rejoice in that. And we need to be a people who carry a smile into our daily routines that we now are experiencing. So the next time you're in the, the lineup at the grocery store or 
you know, at the hardware store, and you're seeing freaked out and stressed out people. How about you be the person who's bringing peace to that situation? You be the person who is speaking hope in the midst of it. You be the person who, who's able to say to yourself in this situation, I am not going to become a Jonah. Regardless of what the, the models predicted and what has happened, I'm going to rejoice that people are uh, being helped, that people are being saved, that people are experiencing relief and hope. I'm going to rejoice in the fact that the curve is starting to flatten. I'm going to rejoice in the fact that there is a glimmer of hope. And I'm going to be one of the first people to champion that, you know what, hey, is it possible we did it? Is it possible we helped to be an instrument uh, in the hand of God in turning this nation around so that we did not experience the calamity that could have been there and that we could have each uh, experienced? Let that be you. Let you be the one who is smiling, who is showing up and showing off the goodness of God in the land of the living. Because you know what? Despite the fact that you're living in quarantine, despite the fact that you've got isolation happening right now, despite the fact that we have so many things that we're just, quite frankly, none of us were ever prepared for, none of us were, had ever seen before, none of us had any idea that 2020 would turn out like this. But despite all those things, know this, that God is holding you in his hand and that he's giving you an opportunity to show up and show off in the midst of this whole situation. He's giving you an opportunity to demonstrate his love and his kindness. And as this thing uh, begins to slow down and we return to somewhat of a normal situation, let's be the ones who remind people that as the scripture says, what the enemy had designed for death and destruction, God is using for good. And he is taking his people and turning our attention out to the world and bringing hope and peace wherever we can. You know, I understand, uh, you know, uh, people who, who don't have God being stressed out in this situation. But people who do have God, we don't need to be stressed out. We have a peace from him. And, and we don't need to be angry that we think this has gone too long or this or that. No, no, no. We're just going to relax and rest in God. And we're going to be the ones who rejoice in the fact that any sacrifice we've made, if it has resulted in people coming to God and people's lives being saved, then we're good with that. That's awesome. Amen? That is awesome. So I just want to pray with you today. I know that uh, most of you tuning in, um, you know, are, are probably already walking with the Lord, and this has been a good reminder just to keep the right attitude in the midst of it all. But maybe some of you here today that have tuned in, you've You've never actually uh, had a relationship with God. You don't even know who God is. And, and you're watching this and you're going, wow, that, that sounds like God is not the person I thought he was. I, 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 I thought God didn't care about me, that God didn't know, even know me. Well, he does know you and he does care about you. And he has uh, uh, set you up at this time to come to him and to walk with him and that your life is to be changed from this day forward. God's doing this for you. That in the midst of this whole situation, you have an opportunity to start fresh with Jesus and to see your future literally transformed by the power of God. So wherever you're at in this uh, situation today, whether you've known Jesus for years or whether you've never actually heard too much about him, I invite you today to go to God and to say, God, help me with my journey. Help me get through this with a positive attitude. Help me not to become a Jonah. So let me just pray with you today. Father, I thank you today for your love for us. And I thank you, Lord, today that, God, you have given us a grace to be able to endure uh, some really difficult times in order to ensure the safety of others. Father, uh, for most of us, we... We are probably not in any danger of this virus and probably have not even come in contact with somebody who is infected. But Lord, we recognize that there are many who are and that, Father, if we 
If we can practice things which will save uh, even a few, then, Father, we are grateful, and those souls, those lives are valuable. We thank you for every case of an individual who has been infected and has recovered. We thank you for every worker who's on the front lines uh, doing everything they can to administer health and, and strength to the people who have contracted this virus. And we ask, oh God, for you to bring this thing to an end. That, Father, a people's attention has turned to you in unprecedented numbers today. And we ask you, God, to, to speak to those people, to love on those people, to, to temper their hearts with your grace and with your mercy. And pull us close to yourself in this season. So that, Father, we might shine your light in any dark corner. And we can reveal the goodness of God in the land of the living. Father, we thank you today for your love for us. We thank you today that, Lord, you have kept us in the very palm of your hand. And we pledge to you today, Lord, that, uh, you know, whether we've not, never really known you before or whether we've been walking with you for years, we pledge to you today that, God, we will not become a Jonah. We will rejoice in the mercy of God. We will rejoice in the goodness of God. We will rejoice in the fact that, Lord, the, the projections and the models that they had at the beginning of this thing have not come to pass. We will be excited about that, and we will be the first people to smile and celebrate together when the, 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 the bands on meeting together are lifted, and we'll be the first ones to worship you and to give you glory and to give you praise because you are our King and Victor. And, Father, we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I trust that you enjoyed this morning's service, and would you do us a favor, uh, you know, just let people know about uh, what you're hearing here and the hope and the, the, the joy that it's bringing to your life. Uh, spread the good news, let people know they can tune in each and every week, encourage people, bless people, release his love to as many people as you can, and let your face be the brightest face that people see throughout the week. Whether you're standing in the grocery line or looking over the fence at your neighbor, make sure that you're carrying the presence of God with you everywhere you go. Be a blessing, be an encouragement, be a direction toward God for somebody today and throughout this week, and I know that your life will be encouraged and blessed as a result. The Lord bless you. Have an amazing week in Him. Thanks for joining with us today. Hey everybody, Pastor Kevin Dowling here from Desert Stream. Just giving a shout out to you and saying thanks for joining us this week. We trust that you received something out of what was shared today, and we hope that it spoke to you and that it encouraged you in this season that we find ourselves in. You know, you could do us a big favor if you would just uh, share, uh, like, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let people know that there's a place that you found that you're getting an encouragement and hope each and every week. We hope you plan to check in with us next week, be a part of our expression again, and help spread the word that God is in control in the midst of this season. We love you. We bless you. Thanks for tuning in.